right, we're back. I appreciate you all sticking with us. So today, we have a lot of crazy things going on in the news. And in this segment, I give you my take on outrageous events in the news. So if you'd like to join the conversation today, please give us a call. The telephone number is 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. So I know most of you uh, have been following the headlines this week, and you've heard about the terrorist group in Iraq and Syria called ISIS, or I-S-I-L, uh, <clears throat> and how they're taking control of the territory in Iraq. Uh, you know, with this said, you know, it, there, there's been a whole lot of stuff going on with there. It, and I just want to mention the fact that according to FoxNews.com, uh, long before it looted the Iraqi Central Bank of Mosul, uh, of $429 million, that's million, $429 million, the Islamic State in Iraq and the uh, Levant slash Syria, which sometimes it's called ISIL, sometimes it's called ISIS, ISIS, uh, was a well-funded, it was already well-funded to a- establishing its Sharia caliphate. For those of you who don't know, a caliphate is basically, they want to create a Muslim state, you know, where they create a Muslim empire, all right? And uh, thanks to uh, raging criminal enterprises of extortion, bank robbery, and petty theft, as well as donations from well-heeled sponsors throughout the Arab world, the latest payday gained the jihadist group led by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, he, they basically they overrun uh, Iran's second largest city and emptied the vaults of cash and gold bullion. Uh, this basically has created this uh, big conglomerate terrorist organization. Now, this group is now the most well-funded terrorist group in the world. It now surpasses the, the wealth of the Taliban, al-Qaeda, and even Hamas. It's estimated that the cost of 9-11 terror attacks, all right, those attacks were estimatedly, with training and all the logistical stuff behind it, it cost them $30 million. So now this terror group has $429 million in their coffers. This is insane. You know, we have a serious problem to contend with now. And, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about it, if I'm honest. Uh, this is what President Obama had to say about it. He, he had a uh, press release that he came out with uh, last week, and uh, this, is, this is his press release. Good morning, everybody. I uh, want to take some time to give you a quick update about the situation in Iraq. Yesterday, I convened a meeting with my National Security Council to discuss the situation there, and uh, this morning I received an update from my team. Over the last several days, we've seen significant gains made by ISIL, a terrorist organization that operates in both Iraq and in Syria. In the face of a terrorist offensive, Iraqi security forces have proven unable to defend a number of cities, which has allowed the terrorists to overrun a part of Iraq's territory. And this poses a danger to Iraq and its people. And given the nature of these terrorists, it could pose a threat uh, eventually to American interests as well. Okay, hold on. I have to stop right there. All right. It, he said, this is his words, it poses a threat to Iraq and its people, and it could pose a threat to American interests. I find it a bit odd how he can see how the situation in Iraq could pose a threat to American interests. Now, what about the top five terrorist leaders that you just released, Mr. President? Your administration keeps telling us that they're not a threat to us. Even though a 2008 Pentagon dossier on Guantanamo Bay inmates determined that all five of the men that were released were considered to be a high risk to launch attacks against the United States and its allies if they were liberated. I mean, this is blowing me away. You can see how this is a threat to national security, but you can't see how that is a threat. Uh, here, he is. Here, here he goes some more. Now, this threat uh, is not brand new. Uh, over the last year, we've been steadily ramping up our security assistance to the Iraqi government with increased training, equipping, and intelligence. Now, Iraq needs additional support to break the momentum of extremist groups and bolster the capabilities of Iraqi security forces. We will not be sending U.S. troops back into combat in Iraq, but I have asked my national security team to prepare a range of other options that could help support Iraq security forces, and I'll be reviewing those options in the days ahead. 
we will not be sending U.S. troops back into combat. This is this is him him saying this right now. He's he's before he's even had an opportunity to look at the situation. Apparently, he hasn't even reviewed all the options. He's saying now that we will not send U.S. troops back into Iraq. By saying this, he is now announcing clear intentions to ISIS, to this terrorist organization, the most well-funded terrorist organization in the world, that we are not committed to securing Iraq. So why, why is he announcing this? You know, I, I think this kind of statement makes us look weak, and we see this president continuing to make us look weak on the national stage over and over and over again. You know, at least if he didn't say whether or not we were going to commit troops, you know, there would have been – they wouldn't have known the level of commitment that we have. By not saying anything, they would not have known that they're not going to be unimposed basically. But this president is a man of words. He's not a man of action. So my question to you all is – does the Iraq stability, does Iraq stability actually matter to us as a country? You know, if not, then, then let's just part ways. Let's just get out of there. You know, I, I want to be clear first, though. I was not for the war in Iraq to begin with. But once we were there, we committed. We couldn't just pull out and leave people who stood up against the Taliban and other terrorist organizations. They would have been killed. And the Taliban would have filled that power vacuum that we created by toppling the government of Iraq. We took Saddam out of power. We created this power vacuum. And now this is all going on because of our involvement. We are responsible. How about some personal responsibility? You know, it, we created this problem. This is our problem. This administration, I would just like to point out the fact that this administration would like us to believe that it was some great achievement to pull troops out of Iraq. You know, they claimed that they ended the war in Iraq. They, they ended the war in Iraq by removing the troops. Does the war look like it ended to you guys? They simply cannot declare that a war is over when it clearly is not. And let's point out the fact that Obama would have stayed longer if he could have got the Iraqi government to sign the force agreement where American troops would not be subject to Iraqi laws. He tried to stay longer. This so-called huge accomplishment, this, this achievement that we're being told that the Democrats, Hillary, Obama, all these people, they did such a good job. You know, it was nothing more than putting people on a plane. How difficult is it to put people on a plane? What kind of accomplishment is that to put people on a plane? Seriously, this is not an accomplishment. If anything, this is people turning tail, putting their, putting their tail between their legs and, and running away. All right, we were there. I'm not saying that I agreed with the war to begin with. I think that we, we definitely should not have gotten involved. That was not our responsibility. But let's look at the world now. Iraq is a far, far less safe place. and it, The world is far, far less safe now, being that Iraq is, is falling apart and, and Saddam Hussein is not in power. It, it's so much more unsafe than it used to be you know we've created this problem we have to step up and actually do what's right i don't personally think that we should have left iraq the way that we did but that's just my personal opinion and i'm sure especially in the libertarian party this is where we disagree i'm sure that libertarians out there are thinking hey we need to get out of there we got no business in that country but look we started the problem all this stuff is going on now because of us so anyway he had more to say this is what obama had to say about it I do want to be clear, though, this is not solely or even primarily a military challenge. Over the past decade, American troops have made extraordinary sacrifices to give Iraqis an opportunity to claim their own future. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Iraqis' leaders have been unable to overcome too often uh, the mistrust and sectarian differences uh, that have long been uh, simmering there, and that's created vulnerabilities within the Iraqi government, as well as their security forces. So uh, any action that we may take to provide assistance to Iraqi security forces has to be joined. ...differences to promote stability and account for the legitimate interests of all of Iraq's communities and to continue to build the capacity of an effective security force. Uh, we can't do it for them. And in the absence of this type of political effort, 
short-term military action, uh, including any assistance we might provide, won't succeed. So this should be a wake-up call. Iraq's leaders have to demonstrate a willingness to make hard decisions and compromises on behalf of the Iraqi people in order to bring the country together. In that effort, they will have the support of the United States and our friends and our allies. Now, Iraq's neighbors ha also have some responsibilities to support this process. Nobody has an interest in seeing terrorists gain a foothold inside of Iraq, and nobody is going to benefit from seeing Iraq descend into chaos. So the United States will do our part, but understand that ultimately it's up to the Iraqis as a sovereign nation to solve their problems. Uh, indeed, across the region, we have redoubled our efforts to help build more capable counterterrorism forces so that groups like ISIL can't establish safe haven. And we'll continue that effort through our support of the moderate opposition in Syria, our support for Iraq and its security forces, and our partnership with other countries across the region. We're also going to pursue intensive diplomacy uh, throughout this period, both inside of Iraq and across the region. Uh, because there's never going to be stability in Iraq or the broader region unless there are political outcomes that allow people to resolve their differences peacefully without resorting to war or relying on the United States military. Uh, we'll be monitoring the situation in Iraq very carefully over the next several days. Uh, our top priority will remain being vigilant against any threats to our personnel serving overseas. Uh, we will consult closely with Congress as we make determinations about appropriate action, and we'll continue to keep the American people fully informed as we make decisions about the way forward. All right, so, you know, he's going to wait several days to make any kind of action, and by then it could be too late. You know, th there may not be an Iraqi government left to help if we wait too long. You know, the president refuses to take action, and as I have said before, he is a man of words. Words, 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 not action. And it blows me away that he's getting – he wanted to get all involved in Syria. He wanted us to get in there to uh, – at first he, he kind of reined himself back. He said, oh, you know, I don't want to put boots on the ground, but we want to get involved in Syria based on how they were killing people. Not that they were killing people, but how. We were upset that they were using weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons. But before that, we had no problem with the fact that they were killing people with machetes and bullets and bombs. But, but then suddenly, oh, they use chemical weapons, and now we have to get involved. But now we see that Obama is dragging his feet on the Iraq situation. And, and my question to you all is, with all the blood and treasure we lost in Iraq, should we just cut our losses? Or, or should we continue to make it, 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 make it safe? Or should we make sure that it doesn't become a safe haven for terrorists? Should we make sure that it doesn't become a breeding ground for more terrorist attacks against the United States? You know, there's a lot of things that, that, that we really have to think about. I mean, is it really worth this? And, and I'm not saying I necessarily think that we should go back in full-fledged into Iraq, but I do have a fundamental problem with the way that we left. I mean, we just basically packed up and left. And now this, the equipment that we've left is falling into terrorist hands. It's being used against the government that we've set up. It's a less safe place because we left. So, so is it worth it? Should we get back in, involved? Is, is the risks of not getting involved going to create a terror state, which it seems like is happening right now in Iraq? I have here on the line uh, Chris. He's, he's actually stationed in Iraq, and he'd like to comment. Chris, are you there? Here, how are you doing? Hey, I'm great. Uh, by the way, thank you. Uh, thank you for calling in, and thanks for your service. <clears throat> Oh, no problem. And if you hear radio, that's my radio from work. I'm actually working right now. But, um, like, I was, um, I don't know if you remember, I believe it was in 2011 when Obama came on TV and he said, I'm bringing troops back, I'm cutting um, the troops in half, and um, I'm going to bring other troops back before uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving. And that's when um, my mission changed to, instead of defending the base, train the new people and give the base to the Iraqis. Well, <clears throat> as that was happening, um, they were taking uh, our countermeasurements away because we were turning them to the Iraqis, so we we're not going to leave any equipment there, or we're going to leave the base and their trainees. Well, um, one incident that I really wanted to call about and to show the incompetence of the Iraqis watching the base was that one morning um, 
we had about 15 cows reach per, uh, the perimeter. And nobody knew how the cows got inside the base. Sounds funny, but if you get in the mindset of a terrorist, how many explosives can you fit inside a cow? Exactly. And another thing that I told, and I, I, I brought it up, is that most of those uh, most of the people working with us, they were uh, I, like a double agent. You know, they would work for us, but when they were leaving, and they even told us, um, there were checkpoints run by the uh, Al-Qaeda. They would stop the taxis because they would take tax taxis from their house to the base to work. They would stop the taxi, and they would threaten to kill their families if they wouldn't give any information. And when they told us that, you know, it was a big red flag, so we had to, you know, cancel that uh, worker, and that worker was no longer going to come on base. But then again, you had the people that didn't tell us, so it was like a double-edged sword of who can you trust. And literally, when I left in November, um, I literally called it. I was like, there's no way we can leave here in 2011 because of the way that we left. It was more of a... Literally, I'm telling you, it was for me. It was surprising. Literally, Obama said that the next day the base was literally on bare minimum, like uh, mission essential personnel. I was like, okay, really? Like, yes. Like you said earlier, um, we had to quit. I didn't want to go in Iraq, but we did commit to it, finish it, not just say I'm leaving. I right, see you later. And now look at what happened right now. And then exactly. I, I saw earlier on the blaze that they were talking about um, the Baghdad uh, airport was being, uh, how you say that, um, rockets were being fired into the oh, Baghdad they're, they're airport. Ordering, were they mortar attacking yeah. it? Yep. And I was like, you know, I was like, man, I really called this in 2011. I was like, there's no way that you could just get up and leave the way that we left. And we left equipment behind. We left uniforms behind. You know, and I was like, oh, this doesn't look right. You know, okay, yeah, we have to leave. But the way we left, it was a transition more of like in a matter of a month, we were all out. So so you're not currently in Iraq right now. You you were there. When, when was no. the last time you were there? In 2011. 2011, okay. So so let me ask you, as far as your take on this, I mean, I know it, who who would want to go to Iraq? I, I don't know anybody who actually wants to go to Iraq. I know people want to serve their country, but... As mm -hmm. far as your take on on Iraq now, should we should we go back in? Uh, should we try to stabilize the region, or, or should we just cut our losses? What what do you think, Chris? The way that it's looking, from what I'm understanding, from what I'm reading, from what I'm looking on the news, and um, right now, like uh, I was listening to an interview, and the person was right. The way that it's looking is um, ISIS is taking over the surrounding areas of Baghdad, and for me right now, it got to the point that boots and ground is not going to help because there are so deep. They have nothing to lose. And if, don't get me wrong, if they send me, I will say, yes, I have to go. But for me, it will be a waste of time to send. Right now, if Obama says, all right, guys, it's time to go, I'll be like, okay, I'll go. But why am I going to go now when the chaos is too big for us, for especially now that he's been cutting uh, the military. And just to add another story to that, um, I received a letter saying that I'm no longer, even though I re-enlisted, I'm no longer uh, in the military as of 29 September of this year. So you could say that I got laid off from the military also. So, again, it, it goes back to what I said about three months ago uh, on another radio station. Um, he wants to cut all this military but if you look at it, he wants to do more stuff with the military when the manpower is not there. Exactly. Yeah, it, and you know, it, to kind of piggyback off of what you said, I I know uh, logistically uh, a lot of things that we do uh, in the military it, when we're leaving a station or leaving somewhere overseas is it, it costs more money for us to bring the weapons back. It costs more money for us to bring the equipment back than than they're actually valued at. So in a lot of cases, we actually just leave that equipment there, and that's what we did in Iraq. And in, in a lot of those situations, we left yeah. equipment. 
this equipment's falling into enemy hands now, and, and it's going to be used against the government that we're trying to establish. So, you know, I, I, I'm really torn on this because I, I don't like the war in Iraq. I don't, I don't believe in this endless state of war that we're in, but I, I do recognize the fact that we have created this problem. I mean, it, we came in and destabilized the region like we've done with the entire Middle East. We are responsible for the problems that, that happen in Egypt. We're responsible for a lot of what's going on with the ripple effects going through Syria. And I mean, there's so much fault to put on us. And uh, this administration, with our involvement over there, that you know, it, it's kind of hard for me to see it, it, how it's it's right of us to walk away from this when people over there, you know, some people may have been double agents, yes, but pe some people over there have actually stood up and stood alongside us, fought with us, they're brothers in arms with us, and to abandon exactly. them like this, and, and we're just leaving them to the wolves. I mean, it, the, the, these this terrorist organization, they, they're over there killing people summarily executing people right now and, and and they're taking over i mean this this is our fault we need to take some responsibility for our actions i think and and, and you know i know it, it nobody wants to get back into a war with iraq but the, in my opinion it wasn't over we just left before it's over so we need to ask ourselves is it worth it you know should we cut our losses and if so let's get out of it entirely and 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 not involve ourselves in that and get in this isolationist bubble kind of thing or let's get involved, complete the mission, and do it right, and, and commit to it fully. But but anyway, that that's my take on it. And, I yeah, have... and one one yeah one more other point that I would like to make was I was also in Afghanistan, so I did a tour in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, and I I totally agree with you in that. There's people that I could personally know, and I still keep in touch with some of them. First, you know, there was one gentleman. He was 18 years old. And this was in 2009. He was uh, 18 years old, just turned 18. He started working um, as a guard with us. And one day, this kid comes crying to us. And I was the liaison between them and us um, as a guard. And then he calls me crying, saying that Al-Qaeda came to his house demanding, you know, saying, um, we're going to use you no matter what, and you're going to give us information. And he stood up. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I like my job, and I'm sick and tired of you guys taking advantage of us. What they did is they went outside and they fired the entire house. They lit the house on fire. So he comes back to work that same night and the dude is crying. I said, oh man, I, I, he's like, I need a house. I no longer have a house. So I titled it up to my leadership and I told him, hey guys, you know, I know it's not our job, but I really feel bad for this, you know, kid, you know, he no longer has a house, you know, they burned his house. And, you know, we got uh, in contact with the CE squadron, and we're like, hey, all he wants is plywood and wood panels. That's all he's asking for. And so we got the okay for it. You know, we gave him, like, a bunch of wood, and the kid was happy. And I could vouch for some of them, and I could, you know, I could also tell you some other stories of the dudes that, you know, that were taking pictures of us working. And as of right now, on both uh, countries, Afghanistan and and Iraq, especially that um, we went in there, we kind of uh, knocked doors down, rebuilt it, then we started feeding money to the country. Now, Iraq, once we left Iraq, then all that stuff started happening. And if we leave Afghanistan, like he's, he said he's trying to do by, I think he said like 2016, then Afghanistan's going to fall again. Exactly. And then what? We're gonna just quit uh, playing, uh, help Afghanistan, then get out, help Iraq, get out, and just go and flip, you know, between countries. I don't agree on that either. I agree. Yeah, it, it, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. You know, it, it's to me. You know, I, I have I have friends that, that that have died in Afghanistan. I got friends that died in Iraq, and I, I think it mm -hmm. is a disservice to these people. Uh, it, it's it's a disgrace. That they've died, and, and we're just going to abandon what they're they're over there fighting for. Now, maybe you disagree with the reasons. Maybe you know uh, people disagree with with us being over there to begin with. But let's let's commit. Let's if we're going to do something, especially in terms of Afghanistan, we are there now. Let's not leave until the mission is over. I mean that that's just to me just makes sense. There's no 
there's no point of us even had going over there in the first place if we're just going to leave and, and it's going to be worse off than it was before. Now, Afghanistan is slightly different than Iraq because Afghanistan was already a, a kind of a terror state, so it was already very unstable. It was a harbor for, for terrorists to begin mm -hmm. with. But Iraq, we literally toppled the government that was thwarting the, those, those influences. We created a power vacuum. This is our fault. And if we're just going to leave now, all that blood that was lost over there, all the treasure we spent, it was in vain. People died for no reason at all if we're not going to do anything about it. And, and this, is, this is basically our generation's modern-day Vietnam. And, and I don't want to see you know, the, the terrorists, the, the caliphate win like communism has spread throughout the world in, in that situation. Now, again, there was a lot of conflict over Vietnam at that time too, but – it, you know, what's right? It, I, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but what I am saying is that this is a question that we need to ask ourselves. And if, if we decide that it's not worth it and we need to cut our losses and we need to cut our losses and start worrying about our own borders, we need to increase border security, make sure that we're safe. If we're not going to go over there and attack the people that want to attack us, we need to come home and really focus on securing our own destiny. But that's just my opinion. I, I really do appreciate you calling in, Chris, and, and thank you so much for your service. Uh, you know, oh, people, no like you, people like you, I, I really admire, and, and thank you so much, man. Uh, at this point, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to talk more about uh, Bo Bergdahl. And uh, don't go anywhere, guys. Thank you. <laughs> 